So welcome back to the show. Great to have you with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. <laughs> there we go. Got your mic on, got your mic close, and everything's all good. Um, Ambassador Zelenko, a really, I think, probably more important than in many years, event is coming up next week on the 24th, Ukrainian Independence Day. What is that going to look like this year for Ukrainians, and how important is it? Yeah, I fully agree with you, Glenn. It's, this Independence Day will be a very special one for every Ukrainian. And um, not only because we just now really realize and reflect on what we Ukrainians are fighting for. It's more than just independence and territorial integrity and state sovereignty. It's our survival. And the second thing is that this 24th of August, our Independence Day, will also mark exactly six months since Russia started its invasion. Yeah. on the 24th of February, which means that six months of fight, of resilience, of strong resistance by people in Ukraine, this is not easy. Definitely there will not be any fireworks. You can hardly celebrate mm, yeah. um, under such circumstances. But that will unite the nation even more, I'm sure. Well, that mm. was the key point we were talking about off air, that it is a celebration of your independence. But how do you and other ambassadors around the world how do you get the tone right for an event like this? Because it is a celebration at a very difficult time. Yes, you know, I think the best way to, to reach out with the right tone is just to, to keep doing your job very actively and just uh, follow all the developments on the ground in Ukraine. So this day will definitely be a normal working day for every ambassador mm -hmm. because the war is ongoing. So we will be doing our job. We will be meeting with our counterparts. It will be a normal working day for our guys uh, at the front line fighting because we will definitely not have a quiet day. Uh, you can uh, hear and see the opposite, that uh, due to the amassing troops and equipment, uh, the border with Belarus, we can expect new attacks, uh, maybe even on that day. Yeah, and because of, of that day, you think there'll be a symbolic quite attack Quite possible. That you can day. never rule out anything right, with right. these guys. Yeah. And of course, it will be a normal working day for everyone in Ukraine who is now volunteering in the territorial defense units, treating heavy injuries in the hospitals. So yeah. a lot of work to do. There's so much on our plate. Yeah, we're joined by Her Excellency Katerina Zelenko, the Ukraine ambassador to Singapore, talking about Ukraine's Independence Day, which is coming next week on the 24th. Uh, when you look to um, maybe what you wanted to do here versus what you will be doing here in Singapore, um, what are your plans for next, next week on Independence Day? We will definitely have uh, um, a chance to catch up with our fantastic community, Ukrainian community here in Singapore. How many Ukrainians are in Singapore? Mm. Around 450 Ukrainians. Okay. Uh, and I think we are getting more and more Ukrainians now as uh, new um, manpower here in Singapore. Many of them are IT workers, work in the banking sector, insurance, shipping companies. Uh, and uh, of course, we will have a nice chance to, to catch up and to talk about many important things with them. Uh, we will definitely have um, many activities on our media, social media, because we need to stay vocal about what is happening in Ukraine now and how much support mm -hmm. is still needed as we're dealing with quite a formidable mm -hmm. enemy. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about the event. What, what is going to happen? What are the plans? What do you hope to do? So on the 24th, exactly that, I have also planned many just working meetings mm. without any kind of celebration. But we are preparing a number of amazing cultural events for September, where we will uh, bring uh, Ukrainian culture, arts, fashion, food closer to Singapore. And that will be also a nice chance for many people here in this wonderful country to see what we Ukrainians are fighting for and why Ukraine is worth supporting. Yeah. yeah. Well, on that point, I've been using that statistic, that shocking statistic with everybody that you told me before, which was it every two loaves of bread. Is that correct? Did I get it right? Every tenth one. Every is. tenth loaf of bread is Ukrainian wheat. Yeah. Prata in Singapore. And Prata as well. Yeah. You know, the ingredients. Yeah. Of prata. In either. In either. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it just brings it home again. How do you, we talked about this off air, but Ambassador, how do you stay so Positive might be the wrong word, but but so committed after, as you say, six long months with no end in sight. Where do you find your positives, your hope for Ukraine and Ukrainian people? 
Believe it or not, uh, the biggest uh, the amount of energy and positive energy I get from my communication with the people on the ground in Ukraine, because it's unbelievable to see their commitment and their determination to keep fighting, despite terrible losses that we are suffering, despite all the cruel reality that we have. Hiding in the basements, uh, listening to the air raid sirens almost every day, it's not so easy. But if you listen to these young people saying that, look, we will prevail, this is inevitable, and we just need to keep fighting, and of course, we need support from our partners. Mm -hmm. Then you realize that, well, that is something which um, cannot be taken for granted. Yes, yeah. we have to fight for that, and this is this is our fate, but we will definitely prevail. The uh, the um UN Secretary General was in uh, Odessa uh, on Friday for the kind of one of the first shipments out. And it's one of the few bright spots, I think, in what the UN has been able to do and what the international community has been able to do uh, in, in this war. Um, as you are looking at that, are you hopeful that this is just the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of being able to get grain moving again, people working and, and you know, getting the supply chain Back up and running. I know that's maybe not the first priority for many Ukrainians. It's to stay alive, uh, but uh, we do know that the the grain situation is a is a huge one for not only Ukraine but for the rest of the world. Yeah, sure. I think this war has become it has made Ukraine quite an eye opener to many yeah. who didn't know that Ukraine is one of the major suppliers of yep. essential food products globally. And yes, uh, I'm sure that it was a, a great achievement, the grain deal that was conducted on the 22nd of July. Since the time. We managed to uh, send uh, 17 vessels with corn to the different parts in uh, Africa and Asia. Great. Uh, we could deliver 450,000 tons of agricultural products. And the plan is to deliver 3 million tons of agricultural products wow. per month. Wow. That's what we are trying to achieve if Russia does not prevent us. When, when would that target possibly be reached? That could definitely be reached. We um, like in the next month or two we, months. Yeah, we really hope yeah. to reach this goal because we need to empty our silos. Yeah. Our storages are full of grain uh, mm. with uh, of uh, last year yield, this year yield, and next year yield is coming. So we really would be happy to to do it. We remain committed to our obligation to the supplier, and we hope that Russia remains um, uh, committed and sticks to the agreement that had been reached. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a concern, though, that that economic situation will benefit all countries if the grain supply opens up, trade opens up and things start to become slightly more normalized than they were in the previous six months? But the war goes on. That is my concern. Grain supply opens up, trade opens up, cost of living maybe improves slightly in certain countries because of the supplies are flowing. Meanwhile, I was watching a news story this week. It was about something else, but it was about Russians on holiday going on their beach destinations and, and things like that. And I'm thinking in Russia itself, it's it's normalized. They're going on holiday. They're celebrating family vacations. Meanwhile, this invasion is going on under their name. Hmm. That is my fear now. Economic normalization, social normalization. But the suffering continues. Is that a fear that you have? We definitely have this fear, and of course, we need to keep the public opinion strongly in favor of Ukraine, because if we disappear from the headlines, it will mean that people keep suffering and uh, not so many care. Mm. So this is something we uh, really need to avoid, and I think this is our common goal uh, alongside our partners, because they all see that Ukraine remains committed to its um, obligations. So that means that we all need to protect the UN Charter. and protect the rules-based order because now even if we have to some extent tackle the food crisis we have the nuclear crisis you see what is happening right. with the yes. Parisian nuclear power yes. plant yes. which yes. is the third biggest in the world so the magnitude of possible catastrophe could be immense yep. and uh, that means that we may not relax it's not the right time for that this is the time to double down on support for Ukraine militarily economically and of course in terms of the information war launched by Russians mm. is also quite a we've fight. seen the Biden administration I think uh, trying to put out another one and 1.9 billion dollars in uh, military aid so we will see what impact that might have. Uh, we're speaking with Her Excellency Katerina Zelenko, the Ukraine ambassador uh, to Singapore. Ukraine 
Independence Day is coming up next Wednesday on the 24th. Again, people can contribute to humanitarian uh, relief efforts. Uh, what is the, What are the current best channels? Are they the ones we've talked about before or is, has anything changed in that regard? So we really uh, enjoy excellent cooperation with Singapore Red Cross. Those uh, willing to support Ukraine can definitely uh, do so, get in touch with Singapore Red Cross. We are now, uh, we have started a new project supporting and enjoying Ukraine. This is a group of medical personnel who try to uh, work in the hard to reach regions and communities of Ukraine. They need support in terms of some equipment, ventilators, medical kits, and that's what we are now raising funds along with the Singapore Red Cross and definitely we need to speak about the rebuilding of Ukraine already now because there are so many people being eager to go back to their homes that have been destroyed mm. and you can use the platform called United24 where everyone can donate uh, in order to support people on the ground in Ukraine. And maybe just mm. on that give us an update for the benefit of Singaporeans listening what is the situation we, we see the daily statistics and that's the sad part when it ends up feeling like just another statistic yeah. what is the what is it like now on the ground for the average ukrainian family so if we take uh, a couple of figures uh, let's say around 40,000 uh, civil infrastructure facilities have been destroyed and it's only in the ukraine controlled territories not in the occupied ones uh, 28,000 residential facilities have been destroyed so you can only imagine how many people um, remained without homes. Um, hundreds of schools have been destroyed and we are starting the new school year on the 1st of September usually. Mm -hmm. So our kids will um, likely have to study online because there is no other choice. So it is, it is struggling. So people are really grappling with um, all the situation. And of course, we need to keep our economy afloat. The country at war needs resource every day in order just to, just to survive economically. Uh, that's why our government tries to create new conditions for our businesses to keep working, to keep paying taxes and supporting the economy of the country. This mm. is, of course, important. Yeah. Yeah. Just on that point, uh, we were discussing earlier the G20 summit you've probably heard about in autumn. Uh, both the Chinese and the Russian leaders are expected to be there. President Zelensky uh, supposedly has been invited. What I mean, I don't know what you can say, but what is your view on that? Well, I think um, very much will depend on the current situation on the ground in Ukraine, if uh, the president can attend or not. And uh, you can um, clearly see a lot of um, information on social media and the media about the possible negotiations and proposals by world leaders to arrange talks between uh, the leaders of Russia and Ukraine. But again, to start negotiations, you need a substance. And of course, you need some conditions for that. You cannot negotiate with a crocodile uh, having your leg in its mouth. So mm -hmm. you really need to have some sort of uh, status quo where you can start from. Yeah. What we see now, we see that Russia clearly chose the path of war. And I think you can hardly find a world leader who still believes you can convince Putin to stop the war. So mm -hmm. He's made it his decision, which means that the only way is just to... Um, to prevail on the ground in the conventional war in Ukraine. To achieve that goal, we need weapons and support from our partners. Yeah, our, face, our Facebook Live friends, Aloysius yeah. Lee and uh, Sean McEwen say hello to you, greet you this morning. And Aloysius is saying, I pray and hope the Ukraine-Russia war will be over very soon, doesn't everybody? And I guess only one person can stop this war, Mr. Vladimir Putin, right? Yes, if uh, the Russian people push him to do so. So that is uh, one more challenge that we have because sadly, more than 76% of Russians support this terrible invasion, which means that there is still a long way to go. Yeah. Which does get lost a little bit, doesn't it? Because we look at it from a, um, an international perspective, as I mentioned earlier in that point, uh, the footage I saw, I know I've mentioned it already, but it was shocking to me seeing families on holiday in Russia and beach holidays and talking about where they're going to have their... I couldn't get my head around the fact that your country is at war right now and your only concern is where you're going to get your best beach holiday. So there does seem to be within Russia a certain disconnect between, and we can get into the whole whether that's down to cyber warfare, the control of the media and so on and so on. But it's kind of the propaganda war. The propaganda I mean, war, obviously. You know, yeah. Seventy percent plus support an illegal nation, uh, an illegal invasion of a sovereign country is a concern because it means without without dissent from within 
it's not going to end, is it? Yes, it is really hard. But uh, again, if we speak about the the society which has been living since I, I think so for the last twenty years, being spoon fed by propaganda on the daily basis, mm -hmm. this is kind of a smoke screen that you have over the Russian information field. So you can never know what it, what is right and what is wrong. And uh, we definitely have uh, also other news saying that look, Russians are not really happy about it because the prices are soaring. It's hurting the sanctions started yeah. started yeah. working. It's just like a snowball. Yes, it takes time, but it's it's getting more and more painful. And yeah, uh, yeah we all need to see what's going to prevail: the fridge or the TV set. Well, we wish you all the best for this uh, Ukrainian Independence Day on uh, this coming Wednesday. Her Excellency Katerina Zelenko, Ukraine Ambassador to Singapore. Thanks as always for coming to join us. Thank you, my pleasure.